Party people, what is going on? Your boy B-Cube is in the place to be. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review for October 10, 2024. So you're getting a Friday episode from me right now. Usually I'm doing these podcasts on Sundays for the most part, sometimes Saturday, sometimes Monday. Uh, but I actually got the day off from work today. I have a quiet house. Let's get it, man. Let's... uh getting to this inter- this uh, review a little early this week. So again, as I keep saying, you're not seeing my face. I think I'm working out something with our setup here to where I can still, in our space here, still, still provide what my wife needs as far as like storage and stuff like that and still kind of maintain my setup. So I'm kind of working on it. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'll be uh, back on camera or whatever. But um, it's kind of nice to be off camera a little bit. It's kind of chill. You know what I mean? I can kind of sit however I want, wear whatever I want, whatever I could do it, but ass naked if I wanted to. You know what I'm saying? Not trying not trying to paint that picture for you guys, but I'm just saying. We're going to get into this episode. I thought um I thought the episode was okay, guys. I don't think it was a bad episode. Like they're not doing bad television right now. But I was I was really bored. Uh it was really really pain by numbers. And that's why I was bored because I just not because it was bad because I just you just saw everything coming a mile away. And and I get it. They had to do some things on the fly. We didn't have an episode last week. They had to make some changes. I get it. And I and I have to give them grace in regard to that. I I totally get it. But that just doesn't change the fact that, you know, what I was watching on this episode was just predictable. I just saw it saw it a mile away. It was just paint by numbers, and I thought I felt like the episode was never going to end. Every time that I thought it was over, there was another match. You know, like it just wasn't an episode that was easy to di- digest for me this week. But again, I don't think they do bad television. I don't. I don't. I don't. I think there is one episode this year. It was the one with the Hardy compound thing that I, I just didn't like that episode at all from top to bottom. But that's really the only episode where i'm just not feeling it this year you know like i'm always i'm negative bq i'm always going to point out the bad you know what i'm saying i'm going to point out the things that i don't like i'm going to point out very minuscule details of course but um i overall i still think they're putting on pretty good television and this just this wasn't it for me i was i was really really bored i just wanted the episode to be over there were some redeeming qualities there there always are but it's again just paint by numbers wwe type of episode you know what i'm saying so let's let's uh let's get into it one time for your mind um it did what what do we kick off with so this was a knockouts six six woman tag team match i guess you could say uh or six knockouts i don't know uh we had on one side we had jordan grace we had sol ruka and, kick out. no not and a kick out we had um masha slamovich meet Fran. And they took on the team of Rosemary and Wendy Chu, Tasha Steeles. We've got a badass over here. And she was accompanied to the ring by Alicia Edwards. Uh, hi, baby. So I, I, I was, I thought the show got off to a good start with this year. I was into this, but I'm, I really enjoy watching Sol Ruka wrestle. She comes off like a big star. She really, really stands out. She's incredible in the ring. And it's believable at the same time. Like, it's not just, I don't feel like it's like flips for the sake of flips. You know, she, they matter when she does them, you know? So um, I'm into it. The Rosemary, t- uh, Monday, two things, losing a little, little bit of luster every week that passes. And they're not, I, I mean, I thought they were going to wrestle for the titles, the bound for glory. Like every week that passes, I'm kind of like, I, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like we're just getting very far away from anything to do with the knockouts tag team titles. Spitfire hasn't been on TV the last couple of weeks. So uh, I don't know, but I thought the match was, was pretty good for the most part. Uh, but I'm going to fast forward to the end here. I, I thought there was just a lot that happened. This episode again, I said predictable, but there was a lot that I honestly just found to be very lazy. It just, I, I just, again, just, very paint by numbers. I know I keep saying that, but you've got Masha who's 
getting ready to win the match, you know, catches an inadvertent thumb to the eye. Jordan Grace tags herself in, gets the win. Uh, and then Masha, you know, is mad because Jordan tagged herself. In. I mean, just we've seen this so many times in wrestling. Just that that's how you're building the match. Jordan Grace has not had one captivating storyline in 2024. Not a single one. And I'm even going to say for the last two years, she probably hasn't. Not since she had a program with, with, uh, what the hell's her name? The Diana Perrazzo. I'm getting old, folks. I just celebrated. So, uh, by the way, thank you to everyone who wished me happy birthday last week. My birthday was actually two days ago or three days ago as of today, um, October 8th. So last weekend I had my mom, I had my aunt in town and uh really good birthday weekend. I don't, I don't usually like to celebrate my birthday a whole lot. I don't, I don't like to do gifts. I don't ask for gifts. Um, I, 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 that's just my, not my personality. I don't, I just don't really like to celebrate like that. Um, but it was, a, it was a good birthday weekend. Just uh, more than, you know, my mom came cause I've mentioned you guys before, God bless my wife. I do all the cooking in the house. Having my mom in town for three nights to handle dinner for three nights in a row was was a, a gift enough as it was because, you know, I work really long days. I work an hour away from home and then I come home and cook and it's kind of like, fuck, man, like every once in a while I want a break. Yeah, and my mom was able to provide that. So that was awesome. But yeah, folks, I turned I turned 45. I started podcasts and doing this when I was 34. So I, I went from a, I guess, a relatively young guy to an old man right in front of your eyes. So. Uh, that's that. But yeah, you know, I, I'd be forgetting these names, Deanna Perrazzo and shit like that. But to go back to what I was saying, Jordan Grace has not had one good storyline this year, not a single one. If you want to say the one with Trinity last year was good, more power to you. It was all hugs, handshakes, and high fives. You know, the, the, the three H's, you know what I'm saying? Like it was just that uh, there was no heat. I, ca I can't get behind stuff with no heat. Um, That all being said, you haven't put anything into a storyline for Jordan Grace this year. So it just feels so out of place now to be trying to throw something together real quick right before Bound for Glory and just doing it with the textbook, thumb to the eye, tag yourself in, and now you're getting a little bit of heat. I keep saying it. Masha Slamovich should have pinned Tasha Steeles. I, I raved about Masha Slamovich that episode. I said, I have not seen a single character story arc from from beginning to end of an episode that well done in a long time but i thought she should have pinned tasha steels in a tag team match and then i thought she should have beat tasha tasha steels the following week in the opening match of the show almost fucking immediately like i would have ended the show with masha and then pretty much kicked off the show with masha i would have had her beat tasha steels again beat her for, you know, relatively quickly. And then before the ref could even raise her hand, just go to the backstage, start pushing shit over. I mean, you know, start not, don't even say a word, knocking shit over, bang down the door that Jordan Grace on the other side, get in her face and say, your next open challenge is against me. I mean, just be a badass about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, or even here, even this tag team match, like just, uh, there's just it just if you were going to go this route i still would have just had instead of doing the thumb to the eye jordan wins we see jordan win all the time i would have had masha freaking win and after the match when the ref is trying to raise her hands in the air she just pushes the ref out of the way pushes soul rook out of the way and gets in jordan grace's face and let's just be a badass and have some freaking heat you know but they're going they're going this route and you know, it's like they kind of tease it without going all the way. And then, you know, Matt Raywall. Hey, man, I really appreciate that Patrick Price on my insurance, Jay, from State Farm. With the Captain Obvious, I don't think we've seen the last of these two or whatever the hell he said. Just letting us know we're going to see it in Bound for Glory, you know. And as a matter of fact, they didn't even announce this match for Bound for Glory. But Tom Hannafin, I'm not going to ride Tom Hannafin this episode. I, I know that I'm always like. I'm like on this dude every every single freaking episode. But this is the episode I'm I'm gonna leave him alone. I promise. So uh he gets to a point where he's like, 
oh, it's all about the knockouts title at Bound for Glory. They, they didn't announce the match. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's like he's already letting us know the match. It's all, dude, it's all fucking shit. It's all shit. I'm, I know I'm, I'm like starting off super negative here. I just, man, just so predictable everything done on this show. So anyway, oh, that what he said. Something tells me there's unfinished business there. That's what Ray Wall said. And then after that, uh, we've got a bad sta- backstage segment with none other than Gia Miller. Jesus Christ, that's perfect. Of course you're here right now. It happens to walk up on uh, Josh Alexander. And he is with Sinner and Saint. I'm just a job? And they're standing in a very awkward position. But... Gina gets in there and I got, I don't know. Josh Alexander's promo that he cut here was excellent. I think he's the best part of the show right now. Uh, I think I was saying that about first class about a month ago, month or half ago. I said, that's the most entertaining part of the show for me, but uh, everything Josh Alexander is doing in this heel role is very, very good. And it's very believable. And it's a, a big breath of fresh air from what we were getting from him for a very long time where there was no character arc whatsoever. And um, the only knock I got on, on Sinner and Saint, they're really good in the ring, man. But they like they look like two, two guys that you hire to, to move your shit into storage. You know what I'm saying? Like they just, they just don't have that look. But I think as lackeys, it, it can work. You know, if you're trying to push them as a standalone tag team, I just don't see like the star potential uh, in the ring. They're very, very good. But I just, I just mean like the overall aura to them. I don't really see that in them, but in this role, I think it's going to be very, very good. And if they do a good job with this, they can really make these guys and they're going to go by the Northern armory. I love that. I think that's great. I think the armory by itself would have been better, but I mean, there's probably a tag team that have that name already. Is that the name of um, the team in a, uh, AEW slash Ring of Honor. I really like them. I just haven't watched the show in so long, but it's like the two, uh, uh, Carly Bravo and, and Captain Sean Dean. Are they the, no, they're infantry. I'm sorry. For two veterans, they have a horrible military gimmick, by the way. But uh, we're not here to talk about them. So after that, we've got, we got Nick Nemeth in the ring, and he comes out. And man, let me tell you about Nick Nemeth for a second. It's almost like when he won the title at Slammiversary that no one saw it coming because I think everyone was so focused on Joe Hendry at the time and a lot of people really thought he was going to win or in a worst case, not a worst case scenario, in another scenario, Moose was going to retain. I think 90% of the TNA fan base felt that those were your only two options and the betting odds had Moose uh, by far retaining and then I think Joe Hendry was next and Nick Nemeth was like, you know, second, third to last, you know, he wasn't the betting odds didn't have him as potentially winning. And you kind of look back at it and it was so obvious because what do I always say? The baby face always gets their comeuppance in this company. No, no heel just wins a feud flat out and then moves on and, and keeps growing their, their status as a heel. Like the baby face always wins somehow. So when Moose won at, um, when did they wrestle? Whatever pay-per-view they had a heart and a rebellion. When they had their match and Nick Nemeth got the shoulder up, like we should have known right there, Nick Nemeth is going to win the title off Moose. You know, like they told us right then and there. And then they kind of start doing the storyline from there where they, because Nick Nemeth has a sweet fucking deal. Oh, he shows up for, he appears to show up for like one day of taping and then leaves. And he kind of does all his stuff in one day. That's at least what it appears to be on TV. I mean, a very, very easily could be wrong with that but that's how it comes off on tv and then uh, there's obviously been um uh episodes where he hasn't shown up at all or set the tapings he hasn't been there at all so they did the angle where frankie kazarian attacked him and they were like is he gonna make it to slam anniversary and it, it was like in the background because people again were so focused on joe hendry and so focused on moose and no one really gave a shit about that. And from week to week, they're like, is, is Nick Nemeth going to be there? And everyone's just, it's just completely going over everyone's head. And then they end up doing the video package where Nick Nemeth's like, I am medically clear or 
medically cleared and I will be at Slammiversary. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you, <laughs> we don't care. And like no one gave a shit, again, because nobody is fucking focused on it. Nobody. They're just focused on Joe Hendry. They're focused on, on Moose. They're, you know, some people are like, hey, maybe Frankie Xarian will shock people, you know? But when they did that angle, the injury angle, it should have been so obvious that he was going to win the title. It was, it was just like right there in front of our faces. And I'm sure some of you guys picked up on it, you know, but like for the most part, I just don't think anyone did. Um, but anyway, he talks for a little bit. And uh, very soon after that, Joe Hendry comes Believe out. Believe that. And I was, I was really bored here. The, the talking segments on this episode would not end. Every single promo, whether it was these two, Moose, Santana, whatever, like they just were talking for what AJ Francis, it just felt like they were talking forever, like they were trying to kill time. Everything was just slow, slow, slow. And you know me, I hate feuds without heat. I hate babyface versus babyface because they did the same thing here that I, I can't stand. Joe Hendry, you're one of the best wrestlers to less, lace up a pair of boots Nick Nemeth, I respect you. I, if there's one thing I cannot stand, well, I can't stand a lot of things. But but I'm just saying, baby faces versus baby faces, where they're both like, I respect you. <sighs> AEW does that all the time. It is so boring. So boring. I respect you. I respect you. And they're they're babbling. And then... First class, aka economy class, comes out. But I am telling you right now, that motherfucker, that motherfucker back there is not real. And I thought AJ was doing a good job of, you know, I made you. We were wrestling just a couple of months ago on the pre-show. Now you're in the main event. You know, he's calling out Joe Hendry because you he, he just sang some fucking stupid songs, and you know, which is which is true. He didn't actually get over because of the booking of TNA or what he's even doing on TNA. He got over because of the iTunes thing, but it worked for him, whatever. And then Nick Nemeth gets on the mic and tells AJ Francis, I respect you. Now we respect the heels. Where, where is the fucking heat here? And, um, you know, but prior to this, prior to AJ coming out, um, uh, Joe Hendry brought up John Layfield. And I'm like, dude, I forgot all about him. Whatever story they're trying to tell with him is horrible. I don't think they're doing a lot right now that's horrible. That is. He comes out on a pay-per-view. They barely even... that It's the cliffhanger, right? It's the cliffhanger at TNA+. Plus. They barely... Even, it should have been your reason to tune in. Now, I get it. He's not on the show, but they, they haven't even asked Nick Nemeth on any of these episodes what's going on with him. I mean, it is so, it was to the point we forgot all about him. And then he fucking showed up again the next TNA Plus show. And it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot he was a thing here. And now, since then, again, we've completely forgot about him. No one talks about him. Telegraph and Tom and, and Captain Obvious on commentary haven't even said anything. Neither of them, even. L like, and they let us they, they let us know everything ahead of time. Oh, and they haven't said a, a fucking damn thing. So it, that's why I'm saying it's just it's just bad. Whatever they got going on with him, it, it's no one's asking for it. Is is part of the problem? Like nobody cares about uh, John Layfield at all. So whatever, it, it just. When, and then when first class comes out, I wrote I, I right here in my notes. It's going to be a can they coexist tag team match. By, so, by the way, Casey Navarro is wearing this huge jersey. He looks like a five-year-old wearing his brother's shirt. He just, this first class version is, I mean, I kept saying it was like the best part of the show, that AJ was the best part of the show, and, and Rich Swan, like they were doing such good work. Like this, has anything fallen off a cliff harder in TNA right now? And maybe it's out of their control. But I mean, I, I don't I, like they just completely fell off a cliff. But again, this would not last. This would not end. It lasted forever. 
And then we get Santino. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And he comes out and he calls first class, I don't know, fish class, fish, fish, fist in the ass. I don't, I don't know what, exactly what he said. But the Santino uh, messing up your name does not work in TNA. Like it just, it just doesn't hit, man. It's almost like he's just reaching out of left field for, for how to mess up someone's name, but it's never, it's never like good. It's never funny. I, I don't, sometimes Santino is good and sometimes he's shit, you know, it, it just, just kind of how he is. But, um, this is not the first time that we will, um, see or hear from Santino this episode, unfortunately, but he makes a match for, um, was that the main event? Yeah, I guess, I guess it was the main event. So he comes in, makes the main event. Then we get, um, just some corny music. We have Ash by Elegance backstage with the personal concierge. That's my dad, but don't worry. He's cool. Really? <laughs> he doesn't look cool. And they are giving the makeover to Heather Reckless. He has an erection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all her fault. At first, I was like, this, is, this looks really bad, but I was actually entertained by it. I mean, they're just not going to get away from comedy with Ash, but in this segment, I thought it worked. And I, I did laugh when they took off her necklace and it was fake silver and they showed the shoes and the socks and she smelled the socks and said, you have no lips, you need filler. Like I was entertained by it. I'm very much looking to see what, looking forward to see what they do, you know, with Heather Reckless, if they're going to change her name. But I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the, uh, the final product is. And I, I know I kept saying Wendy Chu and Rosemary, but at this point, the, these are probably your challengers for the tag titles because the Ash by Elegance character, I think, needs a belt sooner than later because she took those L's to Jordan Grace. It's kind of like, oh, man, she's she is technically the biggest star in the division. I mean, you can argue her Jordan Grace. It depends on what you consider star, what, you know. Um, but she probably needs a title sooner than later. So I'm, I'm starting to think actually it's going to be them. And we always talk about in the knockout tag team division, all you have to do is put together a tag team and you're going to wrestle for the title. Oh, but as a matter of fact, if you, as long as you have a tag team in TNA, a knockout tag team, you're also going to win the titles. It's, it, it's a fact. Like there's, they don't put together a female tag team and then they, they lose. And you, you know what I'm saying? Like they, they all win the freaking belts. The only ones who didn't, and they weren't even really, they didn't really utilize them as a tag team, but like the Shah Taraj never, never did, but they didn't. Jill saw usually wrestle by herself. Like there wasn't, it never felt like they were entered into the tag team division, you know, but it's like, all you really got to do is put together a team. Not only will you get a match, but you will win the belts. So I'm sure there's going to be a point where Tasha and, and um, Alicia win them as well. But that's kind of where they're, that's just the thing, you know, all you got to do is put a team together. I, I, myself, me and Mike Gilbert put a team together and we'll wrestle for knockouts, tag team titles. We'll win those motherfuckers. Uh, after that, we got Josh Alexander. I don't want to play with you anymore. And he went one-on-one -on -one with Eric Young. I think those, like, those times are like the rah-rah speeches and like getting everybody up. Cause like nobody really get motivated off that stuff anyway. But. And I predicted before this, I was actually wrong, but I pick, predicted a no, I, I, a no contest disqualification because I'm thinking they're, they're going to do something about for glory. So I'm thinking they're not going to win here or he's not going to, no one's going to win here. Now, Josh Alexander did win the match. The match was fine. Both guys can work. The match was fine. A little slow for me, but it was fine. But of course, Sinner and Saint did get involved and made Daniel Spencer like a, look like a complete goof. And Josh Alexander wins a match. They're beating him down after the match. And then it shows Steve Macklin backstage knocked out. So I'm thinking they're going to go some kind of six-man tag team match here, but because it's TNA and they need to find a partner and it's bound for glory, there's, I, I feel like it's a high probability that it's 
um, like Sammy Callahan or or Tommy Dreamer or Rhino or, or, or something along those lines. Man, I'm waiting for Sammy Callahan to get on this show again because I've got a great soundbite for that motherfucker. Uh, but he's just he's just doing his thing. I don't know. They, um, they brought him back like it's a big surprise. He wrestled a couple times and he's on the roster. And but I'm sure someone's gonna get in the comments and be like, oh, he's injured. Last week, I was giving the, the company props saying, oh, man, they're keeping Zachary Wentz away from Trey Miguel to establish him as a bit of a single star because he's doing some single stuff. And I was giving him all this praise. Like, you know, they're handling him in a way that they did not properly handle the Motor City Machine Guns where they were just always, they were champions, but they're always hanging out together and they just came off like a tag team. And then, of course, someone got in the comments and said, well, Trey Miguel's hurt. I'm like, okay, that's what it was. So I'm, I'm, giving, um, I'm giving props, but the props wasn't, really necessary and then they are showing um jordan grace backstage opening random doors here comes gia miller jesus christ that's perfect of course you're here right now and jordan is looking for masha that is how they are building the story she goes in to one of the rooms and she's got gia willer with her and they find i guess what she calls her kill room and it's showing there's a picture of Kylan King and uh, everyone that she's beat that has, they have the, the red X through it or whatever. So they are going the heel route with Masha Slamovich. It appears off a thumb to the eye. They had a chance to only, oh, okay. Let me say this first. Only we, only they know what they're going to do here. Only they know what's going to happen at bound for glory. Who's going to win. Who's going to lose. Um, who they see as the face of the knockouts division next year. You know, only they know these things. We are not sitting in on creative meetings. We have no idea. But just a couple episodes where you have so beautifully pushed Masha Samovich to come across as your top baby face, because of a thumb to the eye, she is basically a, a heel here. And maybe she's just being a badass baby face. But we'll get to that a little bit later. But when she talked, she didn't sound like she was being a badass baby face. She sounded like she was being a heel. So after this, uh, we get to hear from Mike Santana. That's nasty. And I tell you, this guy's promos. Mike Santana is a character a bit, you know. He's natural, but he's a he's a character also. But he has the ability to kind of play a character on his TV. I should say he's, I hate this phrase, but they talk about in wrestling, taking someone's personality and turning the volume up or whatever it is they say. That That is him. You can tell that that is, that is his gimmick, is him, him turned up. But it's also really, really natural. And he comes out and he he just always does such a good job. And you know, he attacked it. What I don't understand, though, he had, he already attacked the system backstage. He beat them all up by himself. So I always ask this, where's where's the heat? Like, the feud's over, right? He, he whooped their ass, kept them off TV for like two weeks. There's no heat. There's no heat whatsoever. And the thing is, he probably is going to win at Bound for Glory. He needs to win because Moose has beat him a couple times. But San, uh, Santana has the upper hand right now. Moose comes out, and this was some of Moose's better work in a little bit, but he comes out with a bunch of jabrones saying it's the best security that money could buy. And I just wrote, this will not end. Between the two of them talking, even though I thought they were doing a good job, it just wouldn't end. And Moose has had some really bad zingers this year. He has tried to, you know, to say things to his opponents that are supposed to hurt their feelings, and they're, they've, it's been very bad. There's just something Moose's promos have not been sharp this year. But we said you're a poor Puerto Rican kid from the projects. That was good. And that got a little bit of heat. But then here comes the system. And then here come the ABC. And here come the Hardys. And the Hardys are doing wrestling moves to the security guys. And where's the fucking heat again? Because the baby faces have gotten their comeuppance. They are 
on top. And then we get the music. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And he makes it official for Bound for Glory. Or like Tom Hannafin says, Bound for Glory. He can't say it without Bound. I'm sorry, I'm not going to r- talk about Tom. Bound for Glory every single time. Um, he makes it official that at Bound for Glory, it's going to be Mike Santana versus Moose. So we all saw that was coming. This is the only good storyline in the company right now. If we're just being honest, I'm not, again, they're not doing bad television, but I'm just speaking from a story standpoint and it's not even a phenomenal story, but it's a good one. The, you know, Santana and Moose, it's lasted over several months. We know Santana is going to get his comeuppance because that's what they do, but that's probably the best thing that they have going as far as a storyline right now. Josh Alexander is doing the best work, but, but as far as, you know, a storyline, it's probably this. It just it lacks the heat. They all lack heat. There's not a feud here that has any kind of heat to it whatsoever. Because all the baby faces are going into these feuds with the with the upper hand. They they got the upper hand the last time they met. You know, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like they're not, they're just gonna wrestle and have a match. It is like the problem. Man, I don't know if I, I haven't said a whole lot good about this episode. And and I honest to God didn't hate it like that. I'm just I'm a little fired up, but I just thought that it just didn't do it for me, man. It just didn't. Oh, so, and then Santino saying we're going to get the Hardys versus the ABC now. So we've got Matt and Jeff Hardy versus ABC, Chris Bay. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know why I can't stop saying black, the word black. And his partner, Ace Austin. Is this your card? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's and I. It's not. I, I just no. Uh... <laughs> Start speaking too early there. I I just wrote. Let's get this no no contest over with, like we just knew there there. Uh, Santino and then you know Telegraph and Tom oh! talking about the, the Bound for Glory implications and de facto number one contenders match and all that shit contractual obligated rematches all that shit. We just know that there's not going to be a definitive winner here. The story has always made it look like it was going to be a three-way. We, we saw it coming from a mile away. Stevie wonder could have seen it through a brick wall and it's exactly what happened. The system runs out and it is, you know, causes the disqualification wrestling does this all the time. Oh where it's, oh, the tag team champions are, they're going to ruin the match, and then they think the match is thrown out and that they have no uh, no opponents. And then the music plays for a third time. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Santino comes out and lets us know what we've known was going to happen for a very long time, that it's going to be a three-way at Bound for Glory. Not only that, it's going to be Full metal mayhem. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you, <laughs> we don't care. So we're having full metal mayhem, which is not, which is the much, it, it is the best out of the garbage matches. I, I, I think it is. But we're getting a full metal mayhem and Monsters Ball at Bound for Glory. Like, I just think that's a little much. I think that's a little much, little, little too much, no disqualification, street fight type of shit. You understand what I'm saying? After this, we have what is it? The number one contenders match for the X Division Championship. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. And this features the number one contender for the Digital Media Championship, Laredo Kid. Jason Hotch representing the good hand jobs. Hey, for another 60, I'll jerk you off in the parking garage. And Leon Slater. And I could not believe on commentary, on commentary, Cheeseball Mike Bailey. Cheese. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in the dumpster one time? I got out. If you had to ask me who are the last five people you'd want to hear on commentary, I would tell you Mercedes Monet, Sky Blue, the goof referee, even though I have no idea what he sounds like, Tom Hannafin, oh! and Mike Bailey. 
he was awful on commentary. Like this guy, I, they've put, you know, the Frankie Kazarian's on there. And, and I mean, I remember Deanna Perrazzo, obviously she's not in the company. She did some that she did a really good job on. And you bring these heels in and they're, you know, they do it. They add something to the commentary. Like this was, I mean, uh, TNA's favorite talking champion, Cheeseball Mike Bailey. I just, I could not believe he was on commentary. Just fucking floored. Ooh, it's a negative episode. Wow. The, whew. And this is my day off. I'm chilling. I'm relaxing. I should be, I should be like being super positive about all this shit, right? But no. Um, so Leon Slater wins here. We know he's going to win, which I, I don't know if like they just never said this or, oh, by the way, I want to say real quick, there was too much of, there was Jason Hotch, there was AJ Francis, there was uh, Moose. There's too much playing to the audience of you Tennessee hillbillies and Hicks and all that shit. Like, I mean, you had three people on the show do it. Well, it was four because it's Jason Hotch and freaking uh, John Schuyler. But John Schuyler didn't say a whole lot, but I, I, there was just too much of that. Again, it's just like really paint by numbers WWE shit. But we knew Leon Slater was going to win because there's the way that the division is being booked, I mean, there's no other human being that could wrestle for the X Division Championship right now. There's no there's no story. There's no nothing. You know, Zachary Wentz, is he going to get his contractually obligated rematch, Tom? And a kick out. Because they said, and again, I don't know if I just didn't catch this, you know, prior to the match, but they said they could, Mike Bailey's going to wrestle next week. He's going to defend the title next week. Why wasn't this a number one contender for Bound for Glory? Because they don't see Leon Slater as someone who should be on the show, even though I think he's next in the X Division. I keep saying that. They don't see him as someone who should be wrestling one-on-one -on -one for the title, Bound for Glory. So they know that Dave Meltzer had a five-star jerk-off watching these two wrestle. So, uh, you know, as far as Zachary Wentz and the cheese ball. So I guess we're just going to get that rematch at Bound for Glory. I'm guessing we're going to see this match and then Zachary Wentz is going to come out after and challenge him. Like it's again, like just predictable shit. But I, I, I thought up to this, that it was the number one contenders match for bound for glory. And I was, I was going to give them props for putting Leon Slater on that stage, but instead the champion is going to defend his title, you know, a, a couple of weeks before bound for glory. Jordan Grace, Jordan Grace comes out after this. She hits the ring. She cuts the most lifeless, promo and i don't know it i would imagine that was done on purpose for the story but i don't know why she came out dejected like that it just i guess it was because she found the kill wall or whatever and then she, <laughs> she says I, I masha slamovich she didn't call her by her full name she also didn't call her ham uh, slamovich oh! but you know, Masha, I haven't been able to find you. Like, I, you know, I've been looking for you for the last hour. She didn't say that, but I've been looking for you. I can't find you. So if you can come out here for one second. Her music plays and she comes out five seconds later. Clearly, she's she's there. She's you guys are probably 20 feet from each other in Gorilla before you came out. So she's she's there. She could have been that difficult to find. Gia Miller finds people all the time. So send Gia, send, send Gia to go get her. So Masha comes out. And again, like I, I just thought that they had a real big baby face on their hand. And this promo was very, very heelish. And she said, you're the only person who knew I knew who spoke English. I mean, at any, at the only person who knew I spoke English which is so ridiculous. If she didn't speak English, there's, you're going to tell me not. Where's her interpreter? Has she had an interpreter on, on screen? How is she signing these contracts and, 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 and all that shit? You know, I know that I'm like, I know that I'm nitpicking the shit out of this. That's, that's what I do. But wrestling is just perceived. I mean, it comes off best when it's perceived to be real. When you can see holes in something where it just looks fake, it sounds fake. They act fake. Then it's just not believable because in this, especially in this day and age where we know everything's a work, like you got to go the, 
extra route to make shit make sense sometimes. But for some reason, um, she was upset that Jordan was the only one who knew she spoke game. <sighs> Bro. And then, and then Tom Hannafin after this, oh, you know, we're going to, it's all about the knockouts title bound for glory, even though they didn't make the actual match. Oh, and I can't count. And Tom Hannafin, man. Um, I'm not going to ride Tom, Tom any further this episode. And then we got the main event. And just, I'm just going to keep it going. I've been really negative this episode. I'm, I'm just going to keep it open, keep it going. I didn't care about this. I, I'm here to tell you right now. We don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you. <laughs> we don't care. I just had no interest in, in this. I keep saying it. In this version of First Class, I don't have any interest in it. And very, very obvious, you know, seeing if the two baby faces can, can coexist and they're doing each other's moves. You know, like I watched like the last 30 seconds of this. This did nothing for me. Like. I don't know if I said anything good about this episode. Like I told you, I didn't think it was bad, but now that I review the episode, I think I disliked everything on here. And I'm sure I'm going to get the, the fucking trolls in the comments here because I know when I'm overly negative, everyone gets in the comments, but um, I, I have to give them a little bit of, little bit of a pass because of the situation, but it doesn't mean it was, a, a great episode. I just saw everything coming from a mile away and it was just hard to one, once like the first couple things happened that were just really, really obvious. After that, I was just checked out. I was like, this episode is boring. Like there's just nothing, nothing compelling going on here. The, the wrestling was fine. And they're at least they're building the matches a little quicker than they normally do for bound for glory because I feel like every year Bound for Glory is around the corner and I get on here saying, where's the build? The show's in two weeks and we have two matches announced. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that, that's always how they've treated Bound for Glory, Tom, right? So I'm, I'm not going to ride on Tom any further. Sorry. Uh, but that's, man, Tom. Okay, no, 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 no. We'll, we'll save that. We'll save it. We'll save it. But I'm going to wrap it up here, folks. Um, Hopefully next week I'm a little more into what they're doing, but I'm watching the episodes and I'm kind of like, where's Hammerstone and Jake that look like you were trying to do something. Where, where, where's those guys? And there was, there was just a couple others spitfire who I don't even like kind of like, where are they? Cause they got to start doing something here. If they're going to defend those titles and we don't have Cardona and, and I know you got to take a break from people sometimes. So they're not still on every single episode, but this just didn't do it for me, folks. This wasn't. This was not it for me. Ooh, breathe. Enjoy the rest of my day. It's my day off. I don't have to get all crazy like this. I'm your boy BQ. I will be back next time to review another episode of TNA Impact. I'm out. Peace.